Hello, my name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer for the University. And this video is a short presentation on vulnerable groups in research, which is a component of the training module Research Ethics at MTU, the application process. Now I'm going to start off this uh, presentation with, I suppose, two quotes from uh, the Bearer Principles. I suppose outlining the um, what is expected of a researcher when it comes to carrying out research on uh, vulnerable groups. So in the case of participants whose capacity, age or other vulnerable circumstance may limit the extent to which they can be expected to understand or agree voluntarily to participate, researchers should fully explore ways in which they can be supported to participate with assent in the research. In such circumstances, researchers should also seek collaboration and the approval of those responsible for such participants. And I suppose really what this really, I suppose, highlights is the expectation and the requirement on us as researchers uh, increases if we're carrying out research on vulnerable groups. And in the second quote from the Bearer Principles as well, there is, it stated that the more vulnerable the participants, the greater the responsibilities of the researcher for their protection. And that's obviously just something that we need to keep to the fore of our mind if we're going to be carrying out research on vulnerable groups. Now, when we look at the application forms that we have uh, for the university, the first would be, I suppose, to just essentially to call out that if we're carrying out research on human participants and the participants come from vulnerable groups, then completion of the full ethical review human research ethics application form is required. And essentially another way of saying that then is that the minimum risk human research ethics application form is not appropriate if we're carrying out research on vulnerable, group, group, vulnerable groups. The only exception to this is if the procedure that we're using in the research study that involves vulnerable groups is a pre-approved procedure by the Human Research Ethics Committee. Okay, so what that means then i suppose in when it comes to i suppose looking at the application form itself in for this actually video here it's mainly just to look at the full ethical review human research ethics application form section seven sorry section c question seven which basically outlines the vulnerable participants and it provides a checkbox a checklist to what vulnerable participants if any are going to be involved in the research study and I suppose, as always with any of these lists, and something I've often said in the, in the other videos as well, is that the list is not all exhaustive. There obviously can be other vulnerable groups, and that's why the last option is down as others, in, in case, I suppose, the number, the, the few that are mentioned here, doesn't capture the participants that you may have, the vulnerable participants that you may have in your own research. Um, what will pre pretty much make up this video here is where I'm going to just talk through, I suppose, what is expected of us as researchers when it comes to carrying out research on these vulnerable groups, which is ranging from children aged under 18 years uh, of age to um, participants that have language difficulties to elder people to where, where there's going to be unequal relationships between the, the researcher and the participant as well. Now, I suppose before even just going to that, I'm just going to do a, a one refresher slide, and this is from... Um, the recording around um, informed consent and this is in relation to the assisted decision making and which is essentially the capacity act and just as a reminder that when it comes to establishing capacity what was covered in the previous video is that there is four steps to establishing capacity the first being do the participants actually understand do they understand the information around the decision that they're going to make in being involved in the research study do the participants appreciate? So are they able to kind of take in the information, use that information that you've given them to actually make the decision to actually be involved in the research? Are the participants able to reason and even kind of remember and rationalize the information that has actually been given to them? And finally, are the participants able to communicate their decision by whether it be through talking, through using sign language or another mode? Are they able to do that? And I suppose, it's very much, I suppose, this video here on vulnerable groups is not distinct from or is not separate from the informed consent video. Obviously, they're very much linked to each other. And I suppose it's just trying to nearly uh, capture that in this slide as well. Now, I suppose just uh, I suppose the next couple of slides are basically going to talk, kind of, I suppose, outline small bits of information 
when dealing with the vulnerable groups they are a bit text heavy now i won't read them all I, all the text out but i suppose uh, they're text heavy because i suppose it's such an important concept to kind of get right but at the same time this is not exhaustive okay of the information that is required for each type of vulnerable group it's just to kind of i suppose start you off in i suppose kind of realizing look what is expected potentially of the research in terms of that uh, vulnerable group carrying out research on that vulnerable group and then there's going to be obviously references at the very end of this uh, presentation that uh, you could look at to get for so i suppose uh, some further reading essentially okay so the first will be when it comes to children under 18 years of age uh, and i suppose first and foremost is obviously there is obviously our core ethical principles that we will abide by and these core ethical principles are what hi what are highlighted in our human research ethics policy but in i suppose in tandem with them or uh, along with them there's obviously when we're coming out research in relation to children we need to kind of address or uh, i suppose keep to the uh, fore of our mind the national inter and international child protection policies and guidelines and we need to make sure that the research that we are going to be carrying out uh, adheres to these policies and guidelines and that the research is child-centered and is and is actually inclusive as well and when it comes to the research involving um, uh, children under 18 years of age that the consent from the parent and the legal gar guardian is got uh, is obtained i suppose and assent from the child if the child is able to actually give us assent as well able, or able to understand what that actually means the next thing then will be students of mtu so i suppose first thing is if we're going to be carrying out uh, research on students of MTU we need to I suppose get approval from the head of function to whoever the students are along with the human research ethics committee to uh, access the students so that's that kind of gatekeeper aspect which is something that is mentioned in the human research ethics policy as well and I suppose what we have to be uh, very careful of if we're carrying out research on students and this is I suppose the whole Kind of teacher student or lecturer student that kind of uh, power imbalance is something that's been mentioned in the previous video and it's going to be mentioned in a later point here as well but i suppose we very much need to be aware of that the students should feel that they are able to refuse to participate or they can decide to participate and then withdraw and if they do any of that that there is no disadvantage or there's no penalty on them also i suppose it's very much we need to be aware as researchers that we're not carrying out research on the students because i suppose the students are there in front of us that it is convenient it is important that if we're carrying out the research on the students the students are obviously the the appropriate i suppose sample that we're actually interested in and very much again aware of that if participation uh, in the research is i suppose essentially a part of the course is, is a is a form of a course requirement that the students should have the choice not to participate again and if they decide not to participate then there should be some other alternative available to them okay and that's just something that we have to be aware of if we're going to be carrying out research on students that is part of a course requirement okay the next part of vulnerable group would be people who have language difficulties and i suppose what kind of would jump out here with this one is the consent form again so that informed consent that if there's language difficulties do they have the capacity to actually give consent maybe the consent form needs to be uh, given in writing but also orally maybe there needs to be a second language uh, provided uh, a, so a consent form in the second language maybe there needs to be kind of a visual of uh, so pictures of the consent form as well this is i suppose this will vary depending on look what the actual language difficulty is but again i suppose it's just highlighting look what is the expectation and the responsibility of the researcher if carrying out research on people who have language difficulty the next would be uh, people who have a recognized or diagnosed intellectual physical or mental impairment so first and foremost what we need to be aware of here as researchers is we need to look at the the potential benefit of the research and weigh that against the risk or the stress or the burden that we could be putting on the participants and is are they in balance with each other and I suppose this is really where the Human Research Ethics Committee would actually come into play as well to actually to kind of weigh that up as well. When it comes to the consent aspect to this, so if the individual uh, can give consent, which whereby the impairment does not prevent them from giving consent or even refusing consent, then that that's so be it. 
But if they are unable to kind of to give consent or even refuse consent, that is where the guardian or the legal representative comes into play. And again, that's something that was captured in that bearer principles quote that, that was mentioned at the start of this presentation as well. Elder people. So in this case, when we're looking at carrying out research on elder people, we need to, I suppose, consider them competent to refuse to participate, even if they are deemed to be incompetent. Okay, and, I, and that's generally how I suppose the research on elder people would be carried out. And what that means really is irrespective of competence, the research study should be fully explained to the elder person, whether it's going to be explained verbally, visually, or using another mode, irrespective or regardless of the level of understanding of that elderly person. Okay. Now in tandem then to that, there may be the requirement or the assistance from, uh, uh, sorry, may require assistance uh, to provide consent from the next kin or carer. But I suppose really what's being kind of highlighted here is irrespective of the competence or potential incompetence, the, the study still needs to be explained to the elder person. The next one then is if we're carrying out research on people confined to institutions, where that be prisoners, residents in a, a nursing facility or so on like that. And I suppose this is very much a case look that there's kind of a gatekeeper to that. And so the fact that there's even that kind of gatekeeper aspect to it, that's again highlighting look where there's a vulnerable group. So in the, in the, in the, in and themselves, the title of it, the fact that they're confined to an institution defaults to them actually being a vulnerable group. The second last one that we have here then is if you're in that unequal relationship between the researcher and the participant. So this is where there's a potential power imbalance. So teacher, student, therapist, client, employer, employee. And I suppose first and foremost, what we need to highlight here is we need to be prepared if we are the researcher that the student, client or the employee may not want to participate in the study. So that's the first thing that we need to be aware of. And if that is the case, that I suppose there should be no coercion and there should be no perceived disadvantage for not being involved in the study or not participating in the study. And if I suppose the student, client, employee, or who they are a type of maybe participant that may be falling into this unequal relationship decides to participate in the study, there needs to be a clear distinguished distinction between what is, I suppose, the service that's been provided and what is actually the research. And that needs to be kind of quite clear. And then again, this will be something that will be stated in that in form, uh, in that consent form as well. And very much, I suppose, I've said consent form a few times here, I suppose, and just nearly a reminder from the previous video is the consent process is not just the form itself. The consent process starts before the consent form and finishes when the student, uh, when, sorry, not the student, when the participant finishes the research study kind of so this will be nearly at the debriefing stage as well. The last one then will be marginalized sections of society. Now this is obviously quite wide and varied. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just examples that I'm giving here to, uh, I suppose, what would fall under the category of marginalized sections of society. So this is where you'd have people living in poverty or experiencing homelessness or domestic violence, people seeking asylum or migrant communities, people with uh, addiction or recovering from substance abuse. And again, that's not exhaustive, but I suppose any, I suppose, part potential participants that would fall into this category or other related categories would be in that marginalized sections of society. And then hence that will be seen as a vulnerable group. Again, just highlighting again, all this, and this would have been mentioned in the previous slide. There could be others. Okay. There are others. This is not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it's just kind of uh, helping with, with maybe the thinking process to are, are the participants in our research study, are they going to be in a vulnerable group? If they are in a vulnerable group, then there are certain things that are expected of us as a researcher. And I suppose that's what this is really trying to highlight. Um, as always, these slides, they, I, I don't pretend that they are exhaustive. They can't be exhaustive if, they're, if it's just a slide that there, it's only natural that there's questions. If there's going to be questions, I highly recommend that you, you are really encouraged, I say, that you use the discussions function up on Canvas. As always, using an appropriate title for the discussion, this is where I suppose anyone that registers for this training module can actually answer the questions. I'll obviously have oversight as well. And I suppose really what I'm trying to encourage with this module is that we'll have this kind of shared learning environment when it comes to, I suppose, understanding research ethics at MTU, understanding the application process. 
here are the couple of references so there are a couple of here I, I quickly outlined those the logic to this it's not that I just stick in references for the sake but each one of these do align with I suppose what has been covered in this, uh, in this uh, video presentation so the first obviously is the bearer principles which obviously was the opening slide nearly uh, after the cover slide to the to this video the second one then is obviously uh, is from carrying out research on children under the age of 18 years of age so this is the the Department of Child and Youth Affairs document guidance for developing ethical research projects involving children. The next two are in relation to the, I suppose, the capacity, well, sorry, the next third one is the Capacity Act. The fourth one is, uh, there's obviously a certain level of capacity to that. This is a document, so the National Consent Policy, I've already referenced this in the informed consent uh, video as well. Here I'm specifically focusing on the vulnerable research participants section, which is section five. So page 73 and 74, I suppose, again, not just throwing out references and just every video having different references, I suppose, is trying to use the same references and kind of seeing, look, how I suppose the various videos align with the references as well. The last one is a new reference. So this is, um, I suppose, from the, uh, it's, it's, sorry, it's the social portrait of communities in Ireland. This uh, comes from the Office for Social Inclusion for the Economic and Social Research Institute. And this aligns very much with the kind of the marginalized sections of society, which was uh, mentioned in the last slide. But that's it. Uh, as always, any questions, don't hesitate to reach out using the discussion. And um, that's it for now. Uh, all the best.